Thank you, uh, Elizabeth. If um, you excuse me, uh, I'm going to dispense with, um, again, acknowledging all the individuals you so uh, uh, diligently um, mentioned. Um, but to each of you who have been mentioned before, um, I uh, affirm the acknowledgement and, uh, and say to you, welcome. And to those who haven't been uh, acknowledged, uh, you're equally welcome. You're equally important. In fact, you formed the bulk of my uh, listeners today, so you are very important for me as my audience today. Um, we will get down to business very quickly, but after I've acknowledged the traditional uh, custodians of the land, the, the, the Gadigal people of the Euro Nation recognized um, uh, the contributions uh, for the role they play in protecting the culture and the language and the law of the uh, Aboriginal you know, community and paying my respects to the elders uh, past, present. Um, and emerging. Uh, I do want to acknowledge very quickly Ahmed Pollard, as usual. Uh, you can't get away without mentioning him. Uh, he is the linchpin of uh, pinch of any organizations in terms of uh, the kind of uh, energy uh, in sometimes a very feverish way, uh, very strong articulation of a very passionate endeavor in an area which is very important for Australia. So I thank him for his commitment, and I've known him since the days in, uh, when he was running this organization in its Melbourne chapter. And thank you again uh, for your uh, contribution and obviously to Elizabeth uh, for that wonderful welcome and um, in advance for being the facilitator today as well. And to Pauline, and to you, thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, obviously can't uh, get past not um, having a, a mention of my uh, boss, uh, Emeritus Professor uh, Ross uh, Croucher, the President of the Human Rights Commission, uh, welcome to you all. Um, I was given uh, told that there was 20 minutes to speak on this topic, now I'm told it's 15, uh, so I'm all right. Uh, but I prepared a speech for about two hours anyway, so <laughs> as I always do. So it's going to be a lot of dicing, uh, you know, and, and chopping around to find some rhythm, and I, I'll try and do that. But um, the message and the topic we have today is invariably going to be a bit uh, dry and esoteric. It is about uh, diversity. It's about leadership. So if you bear with me, I think the real interesting discussion, uh, if there's any, will probably come when I sit down on the couch. Uh, it's been known as a couch conversation, though I rather enjoy a fire chat conversation because it does bring out the best element in your final thoughts about things that are important. So. Uh, we'll see where we go from there. But uh, speaking on today's topic, um, it touches uh, my road directly. The question that might be asked is, uh, if Chin is the race discrimination commissioner, then what's he doing talking about cultural diversity and diversity at large? Uh, Section 20 of the Race Discrimination Act does have a role for me. Formally, it says um, uh, that my role includes the promotion uh, of understanding, tolerance, and friendship among racial and ethnic groups as well. And even if there wasn't a formal uh, encapsulation of that role, the fact that you are actually in charge and responsible for dealing with race discrimination, you couldn't do the job without dealing with equality and race issues. And you couldn't do that without having what we call the flip side of the coin, social cohesion, issues about diversity. So uh, you couldn't tackle race discrimination if you didn't deal with other issues about community and diversity and how we build a cohesive and harmonious community. So they are intertwined, uh, and the real job really would be about doing both, both well. So what, what are we on about when we talk about diversity? Um, I think it's very well regarded and acknowledged that we are a multicultural country. Uh, in fact, some would say uh, the most successful multicultural country in the world. I remember the former prime minister, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, he used to get up there in, in front of television and say, the most successful multicultural country in the world. Um, I believe that, and I believe we are. Uh, but there's still uh, challenges ahead, and there are work to be done, and that's the point. Uh, we are good at what we do, but uh, we still need to be able to understand what it is that we're dealing with and how we can, in fact, improve on what we've got into the future. Um, the Scandinavian Foundation sens uh, census and survey and um, numerous census, to, including 2016 census, point uh, very clearly to the fact that we are, in fact, a multicultural uh, country in terms of diversity, 
question was asked that we had lunch today about what, in fact, um, multiculturalism is being challenged. Um, in many ways, uh, every generation will face to its difficulties and there will be challenges coming through. Uh, I felt uh, for a long time that at some point, in some stage, we have reached a point where we have crossed the Rubicon, uh, Rubicon and we have actually now become a multicultural country, whether in fact we think so or not. Uh, we couldn't reverse it, we couldn't change it, we couldn't go back to where we were before, and we did where would we go back to. Um, the real challenge would be, therefore, uh, given that we are in fact a culturally diverse country, how do we cast our mind to it and what, what do we do in defining that present and the future and how we find ways to articulate, entrench and embed the very essence of what cultural diversity means for us. I think we need to do that because uh, sometimes we are very carefree. It's a great, wonderful, lucky country. We don't think these things through. Uh, but we need to, at some point, uh, sit ourselves down and articulate those things very clearly because there are points of differences. And we need to find ways to which we can, in fact, harness and deal with those differences for the betterment of this country into a long term. Uh, the statistics, obviously, and the, the narrative of the history that we've got uh, clearly points to uh, a very big uh, revolutionary move, even though in Australia we don't believe in revolution, but we abandoned the white policy in, back in the 70s. And uh, I always take great delight in saying to people and reminding them that the first, the first discrimination, uh, anti-discrimination legislation that we put forward was the race discrimination. It wasn't gender, it wasn't the LGBTI, it wasn't anything else. It was race. And, and you think back in the 70s, I wasn't here. Most of us weren't here, in fact. Kids weren't born, they weren't here uh, this, at that stage. And a bulk of the population that's moved through, uh, largely from Africa, Asians, came through after the 70s, even though there were many who came here before. Uh, the Chinese been here for 200 years. Uh, the Greeks, Italians have been here much longer. But the bulk of the Asians and the African communities have been here after the 70s. And it is always, for me, a point of comfort to think that it was because Australians, after they abandoned the white policy, said, well, from a human rights perspective, we believe it is important. It's important that we do not, in fact, indulge in discrimination. Uh, we do not believe that race discrimination is something that we, in fact, will be prepared to tolerate. And so we have a clear legislative framework that says, Race discrimination is unlawful. It's been there for 44 years. But here we are, still talking about race discrimination. And there is still a position called Race Discrimination Commission. Uh, so what are the issues here? It's about dealing with the reality of our community, about the diversity we have, what it means for us, and tackle real serious uh, issues about our own values, our culture, and what we believed in. But in terms of the diversity that we're talking about for, uh, for uh, leadership in this role, we're talking about, firstly, leaders with a right mindset, leaders who believe and understand what cultural diversity is, because it is important. And, and I'm not going to go through all the wonderful merits and benefits of cultural diversity in terms of the benefits, uh, you know, uh, the economic uh, you know, uh, benefits and, and the cost of not being uh, culturally diverse. Uh, Perhaps another day when I have four hours, we can talk about that and I bring all the statistics to show you that multiculturalism and cultural diversity is a great thing to have. But when you talk about the essence of cultural diversity in terms of leaders who are in the right place, for me it is important that we don't only have the leaders who are in those positions who are able to articulate, who are able to understand and accept the reality of where we are, but who are fully able to be enmeshed and to live in the air force, that real deep meaning of what we mean by cultural diversity. And I'll probably put a smile on your face when I say to you that you were probably, in the work that you do in multiculturalism and cultural diversity, have gone to many leaders, politicians, ministers, anyone who is seriously involved in this particular area of championing multiculturalism. And, and you, after you know, perhaps in half an hour, two hours discussion, you walk away. And you said, God, they don't get it, do they? And you're smiling because you know what I'm talking about. Right? And, and it was quite 
horrifying when the academic uh, said to me that in a recent meeting that he went for the launch of the Deloitte uh, report on the cultural diversity benefit. Uh, and I won't mention who, who what he spoke to, but he's a very senior person, uh, politician. Uh, when they had a discussion about the report, uh, and that individual said to this friend of mine, he said, gee, that's a nice report, cultural diversity benefit. We can use the report to prove that Christianity is more powerful than Islam. And, and, and this is it. And I, mean, I said, wow. And he walked away saying, my God, is this how they see it? And how do they see it like that? And the question is, reality is, does it happen? It does. And, and so it is not about criticism about people not getting it fully, but it's more about underscoring for ourselves what does it mean for a culturally diverse community where people get it and leaders get it. So when you're running an organization, if you don't quite get it, I mean, it's going to be very hard to formulate policies and programs that will ensure that you get the right kind of organizations you need. And people are supported because you want to understand what is it that the person has been left out, not having a chance to be promoted because they were different in the outlook, a different name, the name was too long to pronounce. Or, you know, the color of the skin might be an issue or they won't fit in. And how do you challenge that? And you would do so only when you have the perspective of understanding what it is it is that we're talking about and that sense of that commitment, that mindset, that capacity to be able to empathize fully with what we are talking about in promoting cultural diversity. The other aspect of cultural diversity in terms of leadership is about representation. Uh, it's come up time again. Uh, we've done that. The commission uh, in the last uh, four years had two reports leading for change. Um, talked about uh, research that's been done to collaborate the fact that uh, particularly Asian Australians have not uh, had their you know, equal share of a position in terms of the senior ranks of our community. And, and, and uh, the statistics are pretty glaring in terms of the shortfall where you know there's 12 percent, for example, Asian uh, Australians, and you've got less than three percent who are involved in the senior ranks of the government. And and I think I might be correct in saying this: in after 200 years in this country, as Chinese community first recorded Chinese migrant 1818. Um, I need to do a bit more research, but I think I'm probably correct to say that I might be the most uh, federally most senior bureaucrat of Chinese extraction. And it's not even the most important position, my God. Yeah. What are we thinking? Um, and so question, where do we go from there? Where do we go uh, from having a position where we are actually embracing that diversity? And they always said, you know, you can't be what you can't see. And if we are a culturally diverse country, then we need to have the capacity where our leadership structure reflects the people in it who understand and appreciate uh, that contribution they can make. So it is a capacity for which uh, this country has largely sort of hasn't cast its mind to it. Um, I've said recently at a function, uh, when the question was asked about cultural diversity, my view is it's quite clear. I think it's time for a refresh. It's time for another look at what it means for us in this 21st century multiculturalism. Uh, because we, we think we know, we think we understand the pitfalls, we understand what the aspirations are. But I think it's important for us to be able to sit down as a community, as a country, and say, what do we mean by that? What does that cost us? How does that involve a commitment from us? And where do we structure ourselves to a point where we can create something that is tangible and solid in building that foundation? We, we still at a stage that for me, it's disconcerting when you still have uh, individuals and they're not insignificant who say multiculturalism doesn't work. They want to throw it out and say, wow, well, you know, it doesn't work. I always take the opportunity and say, okay, if it doesn't work, when in fact you might be the end of board of this or anyone who have a view about multiculturalism and you're entitled to in this country, it's a free country. Please do that, but obviously respectfully. But assuming, assuming people are right that cultural diversity as we know it today multiculturalism, it doesn't work. We need to move away from it. And I, I always take that argument and I take that view as, a, okay, if it doesn't work, 
Uh, what I can't do it as a race discrimination commissioner, I could probably have more power to do it when I was chair of the VMC, Multicultural Commission. Not that I could, but imagine, I said, imagine if I could for a moment, if I could do this, I could say with a stroke of the pen, I could take this out and say, I, Chin Tan, abolish multiculturalism. There you go, sign. Now, what do you want me to do? Where do you go from here? White policy, it's gonna happen, it's not gonna happen. So where do we go from here in taking it forward? Well, we got, like our democracy, we got something that is not perfect, but it's the best we've got. So we're gonna make it work. I think if we spent more time devoted to making what we've got work far more than about trying to, in fact, remove it, I think we might find more energy in building a better future collectively for ourselves. So it is an important element of that diversity in terms of getting the right leaders in places, what in fact is government, in business sector, academia, people understand what we're talking about and the clarity. And we are unclear about this. Let's be clear. Let's have a national conversation, and we've done that through Human Rights Commission, a national conversation about human rights. About what are we talking about? Because my kids need to know. They need to understand that they were born here. Sometimes they ask me, oh, are we Aussie? Are we Chinese? I say, well, hang on, you can figure it out. Uh, I don't have the answer either for you. But, but when you ask questions like that, I think it's incumbent on us to be able to find uh, something in the closet or in the cupboard and say, well, they're there. Yeah, some things we have thought through, we figure it out, we build the bridges for them to walk you know, before they even get there because they will have their own problems to deal with in their own generation. But ours is to find and define those roles about cultural diversity. And when we talk about cultural diversity, we're the most successful in what do we mean by that? What are the undercurrents? What are the core values of what we stand for? And I'll tell you one of the core values that are important to me, and I'm going to finish that quickly because I'm going to get to the exciting part of being interrogated by uh, Elizabeth, and she's going to cross-examine me, obviously. There's no question about that. Uh, she's going to do that to me. It is, is, um, it is that fundamental. One of the things that, for me, and since getting to this role in the Human Rights Commission, is to look at human rights as an important glue that brings community together. If, if you have regard for a, uh, the insight of a, a migrant like myself who came as a 19-year-old student um, from up north, a country up north, and decided to stay on, on the basis of presumably, you know, I think I found some great treasures in this country. And so I've stayed on, to, uh, you know, I've made this my home, this my country. And the treasures are the treasures that I think largely Australians have forgotten, have not given a lot of regard to, have not thought through, they're important. Well, I see it, I see it almost immediately because they're valuable to me, about values about the human rights, values that we commit to, uh, values about uh, the open, democratic, free country. Uh, these are important, and I think, I think these are the bedrock values that underscore for us what will be the uh, values that will not change over time. They are in fact reflective of what we do across communities over time from all cultures, from all background, because they are the mainstay about what matters for us in the long term. And they will also offer us the best protection because these are the fundamental rights about human dignity, about people's rights to be treated equally. And I think if we can get to that point of sharing that across and across all communities and even all religious uh, groups to understand the very important essence of what holds us together for the long term. And I'm going to finish up by a, a reference to um, a quotation by an individual with a very morbid sounding name of William Lone, uh, Sloan Coffin Jr. Uh, when you talk about cultural diversity, um, that we need to be mindful always that it's ultimately about what we seek in common and above all about unity and purpose in our diversity and difference. So when we talk about diversity, it's not about differences, about why I've got more rights than the next person because of my background, or why aren't I getting more rights? Ultimately, it's to fashion it to the collective sense of our common purpose. And William said this, and I quote, and he says, the challenge, the challenge is to recognize that the world is about two things, 
differentiation and communion. The challenge is to seek a unity that celebrates diversity, to unite the particular with the universe, to recognize the needs for roots while insisting that the point of roots is to put forth branches. No human being's identity is exhausted by his or her gender, race, ethnic origin, national loyalty or sexual orientation. All human beings have more in common than they have in conflict. And it's precisely when they have in conflict, what they have in conflict seems overriding that what they have in common needs most to be affirmed, close quotation. So in closing, uh, while articulating and obviously advancing uh, cultural diversity leadership and the point of ensuring that we entrench and embed our cultural diversity understanding and values, we must also remain remember that it is about the common good and the common society we live in. Because ultimately, whatever we do must have an Australian base. And this is the other point that I always mentioned. When we talk about articulating a com common consensus about our diversity, we must entrench it within our Australian, what we call Australian you know, milieu the very essence of who we are. Because at the end of the day, you know, we would say, well, that's a Chinese, but he's Australian, that's a Muslim, he's Australian. Because with that, with that is that cover for which we are able to find that common protection. So I'll close by saying this, that cultural diversity success starts and ends with acceptance, respect, and trust of each other as fellow humans. And cultural diversity is not something that we do. It is who we are. Thank you.